So we've been journeying into uh, 1 Corinthians, and we are at uh, chapter chapter 10, right? Okay, so we've, uh, last Sunday was chapters uh, 8 and 9, and, uh, and we looked at how uh, Paul introduces the whole topic of uh, food that is offered to idols, and he, and he makes certain, uh, certain points there about that. And then he talks about um, himself, right, about uh, the call of the apostle and, and how he, uh, and he kind of defends um, the fact that he's been called uh, into this apostolic office, and he, and he makes some, uh, uh, some points about that. And in chapter 10, which we're going to look at today, look into today, he goes back into this whole topic of uh, food that is offered to idols. Okay, so is everyone ready? Okay, so, uh, so this is what happens, right? Um, uh, Paul, on his first missionary journey, he goes and he comes back to Antioch, and then he goes to Jerusalem uh, for what is called as the council in Jerusalem. There's a big meeting there. The disciples are gathered there. The apostles are there, and they have this meeting, and, and this meeting is about uh, one of the things that it's about is about food offered to idols, right? Uh, they have certain breth brethren from Judea, uh, go to the church and uh, the church of the Gentiles and they share something about, uh, about keeping the law and keeping the rituals of the Old Testament and, uh, and then there's a confusion because of that. So they have this meeting and they have this discussion and they give a letter to Paul and, and Barnabas and the letter which they take back to uh, the church in Corinth. And, uh, and this, is the, the, this is something that, they, uh, that is written down, right? Acts chapter 15 verses 28 and 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well, farewell. So this was the letter, this was the message which they took back to the non-Jewish uh, church, the Gentile church in Antioch, and they read it there, and, and it says that the, the report that they were all, they all rejoiced that they received this message, right? And so after that, Paul goes on a second uh, missionary journey, and we, we can safely assume and conclude that he would have read this, the contents of this letter to wherever he went and whichever church that he planted, right? So we know that in the second missionary journey is where he goes to Corinth and he spends time there about one and a half years and the church is planted. So he would have read that. So, um, but the fact is that the Corinthian church seems to have an issue about this. So uh, they write back to Paul and I have some questions about this thing. You know, why is it such a big deal uh, about, you know, eating food offered to idols? You know, is it really a big deal? And, um, you know, they would have written to uh, Paul. And so Paul addresses this again in chapter 10. Okay. So, uh, so as we study chapter 10, it's divided into four sections. Uh, the first section, which is from verses 1 to 14, would be lessons from uh, Israel's history. There are certain lessons that are there which we can apply right now, today, uh, in our day and age, in our lives. The second section is about the cup and the bread. It's about communion, uh, the spiritual meaning behind it. Then the third section, uh, which is from verses 19 to 24, is about all the idols and sacrifices. And then the last section is about food offered to idols. So we're going to split this chapter into four sections and we're going to um, study, read through. Okay. So let's look at the first section. Uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Okay. Um, so you can follow in your Bibles. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all ate, drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted 
and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make, way, make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. You know, you can't just uh, uh, escape, you know, the, the kind of references, the way he refers to the church, you know, my brethren, my beloved. And, but there's a strong message, like, in between that, right? So, verses 1 to 6, six he, he, he encourages the church. And he's saying, you know, let's look back at the history of Israel, for there are some lessons to be learned. Okay, so he takes them to, through uh, four or five things. And, in fact, uh, these were some mistakes that the Israelites made. And he's saying, you know, these were written down, these are captured so that we do not make the same mistakes. These were examples, right? They were written for our admonition. So he, he takes us through that. Um, the first thing that we see is that in verse 4 he says, you know, all drank the same spiritual drink for they drink of that, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Uh, he's, he talks about that whole experience that the Israelites went through under the cloud was there, the, the, the fire was there, and they passed through the Red Sea. They, they experienced all these supernatural events even as they journeyed, and God was with them. And in verse 4, he says, you know, Christ was that rock. So he's, he's saying that the fact was that this, the Lord Jesus, he was and he is eternally God. And I remember having a conversation with a, with a colleague uh, in the first, uh, I think it was a project that I did, and, and he was actually talking about some of uh, his, his worldviews and some scriptures, and, and he said, you know, but you know, Jesus was born only here, and in this time, and uh, the world was there even before that, and these scriptures that I'm talking about, you know, these were there even before that. Uh, these, these are, you know, these predated Christ. Now, the fact is this, that Christ He's the eternal one, right? He, he is the eternal one and pre-existent even before his incarnation, his physical birth. Right? He's, he's saying that the, the, the drank of that spiritual rock and that followed them and that rock was Christ. Okay? And uh, the second thing that we notice is there are types there in the Old Testament. We see that he was a Passover lamb. There are types which are unveiled in the New Testament. Right, we see some of these references in the New Testament. So, um, so the Israelites, they traveled, the exodus from Egypt. They went to this place. They went to Mount Seir and it took, took them some time. And they went, because of their disobedience, they went around for some time. Right? And they went around for some time, around and around and around. And it was, it was, it was some time. And you see that it was 38 years. Right? And, uh, and here he lists down, you know, these things are our examples. That we, when, as we journey into the plans and as we journey into the purposes of God, that we do not repeat those same mistakes. That we don't get tripped up. That it doesn't, you know, um, in a way, slows us down. That we walk in confidently, that walk in faith into the things that God has for us. So he lists these down. So let, let's look at uh, what are those, some of those things that he, looks, uh, that he lists down, okay? Uh, first thing that he lists down is in verse 6. He says, now these things became, became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Okay, lusting after evil things. And, and we see reference to it in Numbers 11 that um, they, you know, the, the thing is, the wonderful thing is this, that God actually fed them. He actually gave them water from the rock. And yet they had some intense cravings. He said, hey, where is our meat? You know, all this is fine. We are fed up of this manna 
day in and day out. You know, uh, and apparently manna was, you know, you could, you could actually, when you look at scripture, you see that they, they would collect it, and it was there every day. They would collect it, they would make it into cakes, and they would make it into other things, and they would eat it. It was there every day. God was faithful. He was feeding them. They said, what about the meat? Right? And, and they say, they, it's, the scripture records, Numbers 11, it says that they fondly remembered their time in Egypt. What were they in Egypt? They forgot that they were slaves. They forgot that they were actually prisoners in Egypt. They forgot that they were, you know, bonded laborers. They had to work, their, you know, they had to work day in and day out. It was a tough life there. But they fondly remembered some of the things that they had in Egypt. Talks about fish, uh, seafood, and uh, garlic, and leek, and melons, and everything. And he's saying, you know, you know, and we want our meat. You know, there's nothing wrong with protein. We know that. But, you know, it was an intense craving to the point that we said, you know, where is God? You know, God does not care. They forgot that that pillar was there, right there, every day. That pillar of cloud was there, the pillar of fire by night, and all the wonderful things that happened to them. The very fact that they came out of Egypt was a miracle. God led them out. They experienced the favor of God. And here are they, you know, here they are you know, with these intense craving for meat and, and all these things. So the one thing, the first thing that Paul uh, reminds us, you know, cravings for evil things. Things that, you know, in one season probably was okay, but in another season not appropriate. Right? They were craving to the exclusion of God. To the exclusion of, you know, not even looking at God's faithfulness. So today, you know, we, we can look into our own lives and are there things, intense cravings in my own life you know, where I, I don't, I, I fail to look at the faithfulness of God. I fail to look at the way he has led. And am I like those Egyptians? Looking back, looking back at times where, you know, I was held in bondage. Sometimes as believers, we, we go through some things, we go through some trials, we go through some difficult times, and, and we look back. You know, when I was not a believer, I used to really do this, and uh, yeah, it, it was good. Life was good back then. Sometimes we make those statements, and those thoughts really cross our minds. And Paul is warning us, you know, do not lust after those evil things. And the second thing, it says in verse 7, um, and do not become idolaters as some of them were. Some of them were, um, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So it's referring to an incident where uh, Moses is there on Mount Sinai and he's having this conversation with God. And, uh, and the people are saying, you know, make us a God. He, they, they go and tell Aaron, you, you make us a God. Moses, I don't think he's coming back. It's been a long time. He's not coming back. So make us some gods that we can follow. Right? So, so Aaron, he says, okay you, okay, you give us all the jewels. You give us all the jewels that you have. So they break off all these earrings and all the gold that they have. And, and Moses, you know, melts and then he molds them into a calf. And, and he says, oh, you, Israel, you know, this is your God. And they all bow down and they worship. Right? They forget all that. And we look at that and we wonder, you know, how can somebody do this? They just came, you know, out of the Red Sea and they experienced the hand of God. But how can somebody do this? And we ask these questions till we come and stand in front of the mirror and then we realize, oh, oh yes, it's possible to ask these questions. It's possible to experience the hand of God so powerfully and wonderfully in one season and then go through another season and then question God and then replace God with, with something that is not God itself. Right? So here we see that um, and we need to watch out. We need to, we need to stay with him. We need to stay with God. The, one, the thing that we see is, surprising thing is that it was the favor of God that made sure that all these jewels were their possession. You know, if you re read, they, as they left... 
the scripture records that because of the favor of God, the Egyptians actually turned, you know, gave them the jewels and clothing and says, you take it. So the very thing that the favor of God caused them to have as their possessions, that very thing became the idol. That very thing became the idol. And they bow down and they forgot God in an instant. So, so Paul reminds us, be careful, especially in those moments. So when this, when this whole thing happened, Moses was not there and he was there having a conversation with, with God. And God was giving him several things and he was, you know, he was, he was um, noting all those down. And God was in fact writing down those on the Ten, uh, ten Commandments on the tablets and handing it to him. And... All that was happening, and here they were getting restless. So the lesson for us is, you know, if we do not hear from God, right, there's nothing major happening. There's nothing, you know, significant happening. In those moments, of saying, okay, you know, I'm just reading my Bible, I'm praying, and uh, yeah, I'm getting some revelation, but God, you know, there's nothing amazing happening right now. The thing is to stay, stay on course, right? And not allow something or not manufacture or make something to take the place of God, right? So an idol could be something physical, an idol could be something, anything that replaces the place of, uh, replaces God, his authority, his standards in our lives. So Paul reminds us again, uh, in verse 7. The third place, the third thing is in verse 8, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. And um, again, he's referring to uh, how they met with the Moabite women and uh, they had sexual relationships with the women. And, and these women, they were pagan, so they led them in turn to the worship of the pagan gods and they took part in that worship as well, right? So sexual immorality, it could be, uh, it could be dangerous, it is dangerous and, uh, and our appetites, um, our sexual appetites, we looked at it in, in the previous chapters, right? That, that our appetite, our body is we need to consecrate to God. Our thoughts consecrate to God. And our sexual appetite is God-given. Okay. Amen? A very quiet amen. Right? Sexual appetite is God-given. He designed it, but to be consummated within the boundaries of marriage. Right? And so, if we, if we go astray in this area, it can be damaging uh, to our spiritual life. It can be damaging to all our earthly relationships. It can be damaging. And... Uh, and we see that it actually destroys our soul, right? So sexual purity, and, and we saw last Sunday where Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9 and 27, he says, I discipline my body, bring it under, into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified, right? You know, these three things, you see that it actually becomes a slow slide. No, it's, it's, it's not like one day we wake up and we say, okay, you know, sexual immorality, yes. No, it's a slow drift. Right? And, and we, read, we see uh, the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, he said, you know, earnestly hold on to these things, lest we drift away. And drifting away is even more dangerous, right? Um, a, f a few weeks back, I had this experience like I was coming, I was running from somewhere and I was at the signal, uh, traffic signal, and so um, uh, I, I was just playing something through my phone, right? I just wanted to listen to some message. So I took, took my eyes off the signal. And anyway, you know, here's a secret. At a traffic signal, you don't have to keep your eyes on the signal. <laughs> when it changes, people behind you will remind you, <laughs> right? At least in Bangalore, right? They will remind you that you know, in a friendly manner, in a joyful manner, hey, it's time to move. And then all you have to do is shift gears and go. But so, you know, with that in mind, I was just looking at my phone and trying to place a message through it. And, and I realized, I didn't realize that I didn't have the handbrake on, right? Nor did I have the, you know, I had taken my, uh, my leg off the brake pedal. So 
the car started moving, but I didn't realize. I was just engrossed in you know going through the playlist and trying to see what. And the car came to a uh, you know stop, but it scraped the bumper of the car in front. And suddenly there was chaos all around, right? You know, people were there and they were looking at me. You know, suddenly everybody is looking at you, and then there's uh, confusion and. <clears throat> and, the, and, the, and the person in the car in front, he got out, right? He got out, and, and then I got out, and I was, you know, I was saying, so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he was like, sir, morning, morning, why are you doing this? You know? <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry, I didn't notice at all, I didn't realize. And, and, then, and then, sir, you know, he's, he's, and in my mind, in my heart, it's like, oh, no. You know, it's like, morning, morning, you know, <laughs> this should not happen. <laughs> and the thing is, I was looking at it, and, and the car... I don't know what car it was, you know, it was so much of confusion, but it looked big, it looked expensive. And I had scraped that bumper, and, um, and I was like, oh God, no. And I then went in, and I tried to put the reverse gear, and now the handbrake was on, and, you know, the reverse gear was, you know, I was, the car was revving, and it wasn't moving, and, and all that, and this moved, and came out, and looked, and then, uh, and I saw, and there was nothing wrong with that bumper. And he said, no problem, sir. And I looked at my bumper, a lot of scratches. <laughs> he said, no problem, sir, you carry on. And then, you know, he just went, we went our way. But the fact is this, I didn't realize that I was moving. I didn't realize that I was, you know, moving towards that car. I didn't realize that I was going to hit that car, right? We drift away. It is slow. We don't realize it until we hit. So Paul is reminding us, you know, all these things, he just writes down, he says, these are examples. These are admonitions. And, and these kind of things, we don't realize it. It's a slow drift. Right? So we hold on to those things which we have heard before, those truths which we have heard before, before we realize we're walking into a place where, hey, where is that faith that I used to have? In its place, there's so much of fear and confusion. You know, I, I used to be sure of these things, but now I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. Where is it? You know, why are we in that place? Because we have drifted. Right? So... Um, so that's, those are the three things. And then the fourth thing, he says, you know, uh, about verse 9. If you look at verse 9, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. So he's referring to Numbers 11 where people, people actually tempted the Lord, um, it says, uh, where they said, is the Lord among us? They were discouraged and they spoke against God. They spoke against, sorry, Numbers 21. They spoke against God. They spoke against Moses. They, they actually tested, they tempted Christ. And uh, we could do that. The Amplified Bible, you know, refers to it like this. Um, tempting Christ is an attempt to test his patience, question his purpose, or exploit his goodness. Right? Test his patience. Question his purpose, exploit his goodness. And in times of discouragement, in times of um, challenging times, maybe we are going through some times of bereavement, um, maybe we are, there's some trial, some challenge, and, and, uh, and those are times, you know, to watch out for, vulnerable moments to watch out for. Uh, well, God is not against us asking him questions. There were people asking questions in the ministry of, uh, of the Lord Jesus. You know, there were people asking questions. And there were people who were asking questions. You know, if you know, there's a difference, right? There were some Pharisees. There were some scribes who were asking him questions. And th those, were, those questions were not to really know answers. They knew they, they, their position. They're not going to change their position no matter what they're going to hear. And they question in order to corner. They question with rebellion in their hearts. Right? God is not opposed to asking questions, but there's a, there's a difference between asking questions and really questioning God. Right? And, and we see that here. They tested Christ. They tempted. They tested Christ. Um, so we see that here. So um, believe in His promise. Uh, you know, we can go out. We can go and we can went. We can pour out our hearts to God, but He will answer. You know, he will answer um, and, and sometimes we, we just need to trust him. We just need to trust him and say, Lord, I, I know I'm struggling with this. I know I'm struggling with this. I, I have these challenges. I have these questions, but I'm, I, I'm trusting you with the answers. I'm trusting you with the answers, God. You know, you speak, you lead. Right. 
And, um, and the fifth thing that we see is in verse 10, where Paul writes and he says, um, you know, they were complaining and murmuring. And so they were complaining and murmuring and we're saying, you know, is God here? Is God, is God watching? Is, is God really, does he care? And so on. So especially in times of transition when things are not really, you know, in place and uh, when we complain. Uh, when we murmur against the purpose of God, against God himself, and maybe sometimes against the nature of God and the character of God. So uh, Paul reminds us, you know, avoid. Uh, these things are examples. Do not do these things. So five things. You know, firstly, lust for evil things. Secondly, idolatry. Thirdly, sexual impurity. Fourth, tempting Christ. And fifth, complaining and murmuring. And... Um, and, and in verse, verses 12 to 14, 12, he says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. A, a very sobering thought, but something that we need to take note. Right? Okay. So let's move on um, to verse 13. Verse 13, he says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, this Greek word temptation, it could refer to adversity or testing or trouble and also an enticement or a uh, inducement to sin. But here, with the context here, he's referring to, you know, testing times or adversities and, and so on. So he's saying, um, oh, sorry, he's, he's referring to the other thing, enticement to sin, right? He's, so he's saying that God will make a way of escape. God will put an exit sign there, but you be mindful that you see that sign and go through that, right? Let's read that verse again. 1 Corinthians, um, yeah, we're, we're in 10. And no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. So whatever temptation that we have face, facing or we faced, we are able to exit. We are able to overcome. Right? It says here that the Lord, he will not allow you to, to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So may we be open, may our, may our eyes be open to that, to that exit sign. Let's not miss that exit sign. Because he, he makes a way. He makes a way. So some, sometimes when, when we go through temptation, when there's an inducement to sin, you know, the thing is, it's too overwhelming. Right? It's too overwhelming. And I face this many times, and I'm, I'm going to face it again, and I'm just going to give in. But let's be reminded of this verse. Let's be reminded of this truth, that God has made a way out. Okay? So we can exit. And we continue to resist this temptation. We continue to resist temptation so that we don't fall into sin. Amen? Okay. So that was, that was about the first thing. The second section is about the cup and the bread. Okay. So uh, we see this in um, verses 15 to 18. So let's read that. Verse 15, I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one, body, one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? So he's inviting them, he's calling them wise. So you, he's inviting them to think through this thing, to reason through. And he's saying, you know, you judge for yourselves what I say. And, um, and he's, he's saying, you know, uh, this is the thing, the cup of blessing which we bless. And uh, this word communion uh, comes from the Greek word which we all know, you know, koinonia, which means fellowship, which means to participate in, 
to share in and to to uh, to participate to partake of uh, to really partner with right so that's communion so he's saying here this cup of blessing so this cup that we are going to take part of or drink from it's actually a cup of blessing it's meant to pour blessing into our lives okay so this communion that you're going to do it's it's actually a cup of blessing the cup from we drink that we drink from to bring blessing administer blessing into our lives and he's saying which we bless the cup of blessing which we bless so we speak and we pronounce blessing over it and we drink it and he's saying is it you no know, the communion of the blood of christ that sacrifice that blood sacrifice that happened on the cross is it not the communion are we not partakers of what was achieved for us of what that blood bought for us on the cross so you know he's saying this this is a this is a blessing this cup that we drink from it's a blessing because it reminds us it it points to that 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 blood which was shed for us on the cross and it's supposed to bring blessing into our lives as we pray and 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 we take and we drink right the benefits of the blood of christ and uh, and the, and and it also refers to the communion of the body of christ the bread that we eat again refers to the body of the lord the spiritual body the church that we are all part of okay and reminds us about communion the blessing that we receive and and as we take part in the communion you know month after month and this is something that we need to keep in mind you know for me um i was uh, in a church service right where there was communion and um you know my background is i come from a csi methodist you know that kind of a thing uh, background so uh, so before coming to apc right uh, so that was my route and uh, so i was in this church service and that, that was the first time where i'd seen communion uh in that manner right so in the csi church the communion is you know it's all reverent it's quiet and uh, you know we're all for that we know you know we're talking about uh referring to the the death of the lord on the cross and and it's reverent and there is a place but here in this church it was as if somebody scored a goal you know just then right and here i am you know holding on to this communions communion elements and and it was as if somebody had scored a goal everybody's cheering yes lord everybody's giving thanks and for me you know i i hadn't really got the revelation of what communion meant what happened on the cross and paul is referring to that cup and he's saying it's a cup of blessing yes there is a praise place for you know for reverence and 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 to be quiet and really reflect on what the lord did for us his love for us his forgiveness and so on but he's saying here it's a cup of blessing so i was there and and everybody was cheering you know can you just imagine you know maybe 400 of us just erupting into a you know wild cheering and saying yes lord thank you lord you know as they are taking part in the communion saying i thank you for what you did for us on the cross i thank you and that's the thing you know so next time you know we take part is two weeks from now and we take part in the communion you know there is a place for us to cheer thank the lord and say lord i thank you for what you did for me on the cross i thank you because it's mine i thank you this this blood you shed your blood you you paid this greatest price so that you know i can receive i can enjoy it it's a cup of blessing and the bread that it's it's the body of the lord so he's saying you know this is what it is and and the thing is this that we are actually taking part right taking part there's a spiritual transaction that's happening as we take part in the communion we are receiving something into our lives there is a spiritual transaction so he's referring to the spiritual act there this is the spiritual dimension there is blessing that is coming in there's something that is being broken there's victory that's coming in this curse that is being broken you know there are addictions there are chains that are being broken as we take part in that communion so he's referring to that saying hey this is a cup of blessing this is the body of 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 Christ you know which we are all all a part of right? and then the life of and the life of Christ flows in us zoe god kind of life right and and he's referring to that so from that place he's moving on to something where he's going to draw a parallel 
and which is the third section, which is about idols and sacrifices. Okay, so let's read from verse 19. He's saying, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship, koinonia, with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Okay, so he spoke about the Lord's table, about the spiritual side of it, dimension of it, how it's a cup of blessing, how it's the body of the Lord, and how we participate. When we take part, we participate. We have koinonia. We have fellowship. We are receiving something right, in our spirit. And there is a spiritual dimension to it. And, he, and he's, then he talks about this. Right? He's saying, we know that, you know, the point that he makes again, uh, he repeats that, um, what he made in verse 8. We know that an idol is nothing. We know that it's representative of something, but it's nothing. But the food offered to it is nothing. Food does not commend us to God. It not, does not take us away. So it's, it's nothing. Right? But then he says... When you do that as an act of worship, you are actually having koinonia, fellowship. You're participating, and in response to your faith, you're actually receiving something. Right? And now that's a serious thing. Right? And that is what he says. You know, our God is a jealous God. Verse 22, he said, how can we provoke the Lord to jealousy? How can you be part of the table, Lord's table, and be part of the table of demons? And I was just reading through some, uh, you know, some background to it. And, and we see that, you know, there used to be invitations issued. You know, welcome to, you are welcome, I so-and-so welcome you to the table of, you know, a deity. Right? In the temple of a deity. So it was actually a table where it, there was something like a supper or a fellowship meal where you take part in the, the you know, you're there, you're having koinonia and there's something happening. There's a fellowship that's happening and it's an act of worship. So there were actually invitations and the Corinthians were being part of that and part of this, this as well. Right? And, and Paul is saying, you know, you can't do that. You know what communion is. Right? It's, it's, you are receiving something. You are opening your life to the blessings that come from the finished work of the cross. In the same way, how can you go and sit at the table of demons and you know, make your life receptive, uh, open your life to something, you know, what is happening there? So he's warning them. Right? He's saying, you cannot do that. How can you provoke the Lord to jealousy? You know, are we stronger than he? And then he says, you know, all things are lawful. We know that eating something or drinking something is not going to, you know, take you away from God or it's not going to take you closer to God. You know, it, it's, it is all things are lawful, but the, all things are not helpful. It's not going to be helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things edify or build me up in the spirit. It's not going to bring constructive spiritual progress to me. So therefore... You know, why do I do this? Why should I do this? Okay. So, so it's, a, it's a challenge for us. You know, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Right? So it could be lawful. It's not against the law of the land. Maybe it's, it's lawful. Maybe it's part of popular culture. But these things are not helpful, nor are they edifying, nor do they build me up. So Paul is saying, you know, it does, it's not helpful. It could be lawful. So, you know, we need to really look back into our lives, you know. Yes, it seems to be lawful. It seems to be culturally okay. But, you know, is this bringing in some edification into my life? Is this something that I can say no to? Right? Um, so, and, and Paul says, and he, and he also says, um, this is in, in verse 24. He says, let no one seek his own but each one the other's well-being. And 
you know, we, we saw in, in chapter 8, that we need to be mindful of a brother who does not seem to be as strong as we are, maybe. You know, who, whose conscience we are not supposed to wound. You know, he's calling it the weaker brother or the weaker sister. Right? So, so let all things be done. You be mindful of the others when you do this. So he's saying you be mindful. Okay. Then the last section that he uh, refers to is in uh, verses 25 to 33. Okay, so let's read through. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is said before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Right? So in chapter 8, we saw that there were a couple of scenarios that the believers was face, believer was facing, that there was meat that was um, sacrificed to some deities, and it was also available in the market. Right? So um, probably there was no way of differentiating. Right? So he's saying, eat whatever is sold. You don't you go to Russell Market, you, you know, you get whatever is sold. You don't ask any questions, you know. You just eat. Okay, a big hallelujah. Yes. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. You know, uh, when you're doing a pre those days, when you're doing um, pre uh, preparation, you know, a couple came and asked, you know, Pastor, you know, he likes pork. You know, isn't pork against, uh, you know, the, the thing? Are we not supposed to eat pork? So, and this is the ref scripture reference that I went to. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market. You know, ask no questions. <laughs> right. But you be mindful of the calorie. You be mindful of the cholesterol and the sugar and the uric acid. <laughs> right. But the thing is this, you know, he eat whatever is sold. Um, th so this could be some scenario, you know, that meat that is offered in the market, it, it is sacrificed to idols. There's no way of differentiating. No problem. You go and you... Uh, you go take part in it, right? Because earth is the Lord's and its fullness. And, um, and also Paul says, you know, if you pray over, you know, you, you pray, it is cleansed. Um, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and uh, verse four, verses 4 and 5, this is what he says. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Okay, so... Just go ahead and do it. But there's another scenario which he talks about in verse 27. Okay, and this is the scenario. He says, if any of you, uh, those who do not believe, invites you to dinner and you desire to go, and even in that place, you eat whatever is set before you. You pray, you give thanks. It is cleansed by the word of God and pray prayer. So you take part in it. But if anyone says to you during the, you know, uh, says to you that this was offered to idols, okay, then do not take part. But you, that, what is interesting is, it, is this. Do not pay, take part uh, for the sake of the one who said it. Because of that person's conscience. Right? For him, taking part is an act of worship to that particular spiritual entity. And therefore, for that sake of that person's conscience, you do not, you politely refuse. Okay? Um, and, and that's the thing. So it's not like, hey, something's going to happen now if I, you know, if I eat it. No, he's saying for the sake of that person's conscience. It's very clear. Right? And I know, you know, that's a challenge for, that's a challenge even today for us, right? I worked in several companies and, and that's a challenge there. Maybe you're invited to someone and, and that's a challenge. But he's saying you, you, you politely do it. You do it. In fact, if you, if you read through, he says, uh, you know, give no offense 
don't do it in an offensive manner. Right? Um, when you're refusing, do it politely. In fact, I'm reminded of, um, uh, slightly out of context, but then I'm just reminded of this particular incident where, where um, this man of God, he was, uh, he was, you know, he was working in this company, and I think most of you know Brother Ramchandra Rajkumar. You know, he's working in Siemens, and and one day a colleague of his came and told him very politely and, and with all humility, you know, Raj, you know, Jesus is the Lord. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And the gods that you worship, the spiritual entities that you worship, they are not gods but demons. And uh, I know that must have taken him something to say. You know, it's, it's not just politely refusing, but, you know, he came and he did that. But what happened was this. So, Brother Raj, he said, okay, I'm going to read his scripture. And from that, I'm going to point out and show that this statement that he made was wrong. And so, from that time onwards, for a year, you know, he started reading the Bible. And he, he talks about how he went and he bought the Bible and he said, okay, there are two sections to it. Old Testament is old, New Testament is new. I'll start with the new. Okay, so he started reading the New Testament and he started reading it and then he would wait for those times where Jesus is mentioned because every time he read the word Jesus, there was something strange happening to him. There was a strange peace in his heart. So he would just wait for those moments. And in, in, a, in the course of one year, he said, I could not refuse. I could not refuse the fact that I could not refuse his love, I saw his character, I saw his nature, and I could not refuse Jesus. And, and the point that I'm sharing is that these moments, you know, so-called uncomfortable moments where we are, you know, it seems so uncomfortable and we have to refuse, these moments can become moments of destiny or change in destiny in the person who comes and actually offers so he's, he's politely refused and say, and it, it gives us an opportunity to share why we are refusing. And it takes, I know it takes a lot of grace, right? Uh, it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of grace, but, but hey, we have the one who is grace himself. We have the one who is, you know, the God of grace and he is with us. He will give us the grace. And those moments could become times where, uh, at times where, you know, it just sets people on a journey to discover the Lord, to discover Jesus, and a change in destiny in the lives of so many others, right? So let's not look at it as uncomfortable moments, but really as moments where God gives us the grace to refuse politely um, with this understanding, right? With this understanding, and he says, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Now, if we would step into our workplace, if we would, if we would step into our businesses, our schools and colleges with this, that, Lord, you use me to change the destinies of people. Uh, I'm going there as, as a carrier of your presence. I'm going there as a carrier of your anointing. God, won't you use me to, to, you know, to, to just set people on that path? It, it could be a long path of recovery, a long path of discovery. But Lord, would you, set, you use me to set people on that path? And I'm sure the Lord would do that. Right? So many takeaways um, from chapter 10. And uh, uh, but the thing is this. You know, it's four sections, if you look at it very quickly, um, lessons that we learn from Israel's history, some things that we can apply personally in our lives as well. And then he talks about the cup and the bread. So next time we take communion, you know, you look at it in a whole new, different way altogether, right? It's a cup of blessing. And we're talking about the body, which we are part of that body. Right, the bread that we eat, part of that body, the spiritual body, whose head is the Lord. And then thirdly, about idols and sacrifices and, and how when we partake of the table of demons, like the whole act of worship, we are actually participating, opening up, you know, inviting something into uh, our lives, right? And then lastly, about food offered to idols and, and, and so on. So, so, so many takeaways here. So why don't we just pray, take some time to pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Ask the Lord to, um, as the worship team comes up, ask the Lord to, um, you know, emphasize certain things, right? Emphasize um, things in our heart.
Thank you, Lord. Lord, we, as we look into your word, Lord, we, we just thank you that you are so mindful of us. Lord, you've set signposts everywhere that we do not miss it. You love us, you care for us so deeply that you do not want our lives to be destroyed, Lord, prematurely. Lord, you love us so much. The very plans that you have for us is to give us a hope and a future. And your heart's desire is that we journey into that, Lord. We journey into that joyfully. The fullness of it, God. And Lord, we thank you that all these examples are there so that we learn so that we are admonished, that we are corrected and that we change path, that we change course, that we align our hearts to yours, Lord. Hallelujah. So just speak to him, talk to him. Say, Lord, what is it that you want to show me? What is it that you want to show me, God? something that you know we you seem to be bound by you know, maybe we call it an addiction but you're not calling that yet <laughs> you know you're saying I'm not addicted and you're saying just I'm just justifying it yeah I maybe just reasoning arguing it's not an addiction yet but it's on the threshold of becoming something that could control that your whole life could revolve around that thing. It could be some substance. It could be some habit. And that's really, you know, overwhelming. Your whole thinking, whole reasoning, and relationship with people, and just changing all that. And the Lord cares for you too deeply to let you remain that way. Let you remain. He cares for us too deeply to let us remain in that place. And this morning could be a could be a time to, you know, just receive that deliverance from him, receive that breakthrough from him in that area. And say, Lord, these cravings, these the intensity of it, oh God, it needs to be broken. And maybe, you know, we've replaced God with something. You know, there's a plan B. Well, God is there. He's there on Sundays. He's there during my quiet time, but, but really, I live my life according to plan B. You know, there's something else that has taken the place of God. He is not the preeminent one in my life. You know, if, if you let that happen gradually over the years, you know, can we come back to him and say, Lord, you are my God. You are my Lord. My allegiance is to no one, nothing else except you. You know, it could even be a human being sometimes, you know, a relationship where we have placed that person, you know, on a pedestal, like almost like a celebrity and, and we've replaced God. God is a jealous God. But he's also a loving God. He wants us to come and you know, just give him that honor and that worship that he, only he is worthy of. And if we've, if we've sinned in this area of sexual impurity, and in this area of um, you know, sexually we can come back to him. We can come back to him and receive cleansing, forgiveness, restoration of our soul which has been damaged by that very act and we've really if we have shaken our fist at God you know if we have tempted Christ we have complained murmured taking our eyes off the blessing just look around 
know it will help us if we just list down the material things that we have if we list down the relationships that we have you know family friends maybe at work colleagues and if we just list down you know it will be like truly like blessings after blessings that we cannot actually will be can be run out of and then the and the greatest blessing of all the lord himself his presence saying i will never leave i will never forsake i will never leave so this morning all these things happened to the people of israel as examples so that we don't have to go that same path we don't have to go down that road and if we are down that road today's the day we make a u turn today's the day we stop and so we say yes to jesus
keep light in the darkness my God that is who you are you are we make a miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my God that is spend some time praying for these things and we're going to open up the altar right? uh, I'll probably call the life group leaders and the prayer leaders you know, if you're here uh, would you like to come forward and stand here please um, life group leaders worship leaders prayer leaders you know if you're here as husband and wife you can come and stand here as husband and wife and just going to spend some time praying um, and if you have needs other than what we you know uh, other than the areas that we mentioned it's fine you know if you want to pray for a breakthrough you're saying I have this particular need and uh, you know this, this is the time uh, for us to really pray intercede um, maybe you need to hear from God God is here to confirm certain things that he's put in your heart. You know, there's a word of knowledge, a prophecy. Uh, maybe there's something wrong, physically wrong with your body. And um, as we pray, just believe that the finished work of the cross you know, will be made manifest in our bodies. Maybe there's something to do with the minds. Uh, maybe there's lack of peace and there's confusion. And you know, Come and let's, let's spend some time praying. And as the team just plays uh, softly, just want to open up this time. So just invite anyone, right? Uh, if you have a particular need and you want to be prayed for, just come forward and um, we'll stay, spend this time praying. Um, just want to close the service by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Remain and be with us now and forever. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.